So hopefully today I, I'm going to give you a, a, an overview or a scene setter for many of the talks to come. It'll be fairly light on data, and if you want any more detail, please ask me afterwards. Um, and I will start by introducing you to an Irish view on ageing that I really like, Oscar Wilde. Now, to get back to my youth, I would do anything in the world except take exercise, get up early, or be respectable. I do like this, but it really it, it doesn't work, even though it encapsulates two of the key features, if not three. You know, exercising, sleeping, and lifestyle that do impact on how we age. We can think of aging really as a process. And Graham Pavelic's lab came up with this mouthful quite some time ago now. That age is an accumulation of deficits that take place in different individuals in different ways with a variety of different rates for different organ systems. <coughs> Essentially, there's a, a great deal of inter, uh, individual, individual variability in how we age. It's kind of reminiscent of uh, Anna Karenina at the start when they're talking about all happy families are alike and each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Well, we all age unhappily. We are the unhappy families. And to that end, we have to think of when and where aging starts. The process starts pre-conception in your mum's and your grandmother's womb. It ends with your death. Fortunately, it's not passive, it's active. So we can intervene. And what we're trying to do currently, having realised that ageing is malleable, is when and where and how to intervene to give us more health in old age and to bridge that gap between you know, increasing longevity in society and years where we live with a, a range of different morbidities. So we want to compress that to weeks and months rather than the 10 to 15 years we currently have living with ill health in old age. And being based in Glasgow, um, it's important to understand how we can intervene. So if I look at my own aging trajectory here, age 10, age 30, and then at age 60, um, if this was Glasgow, I would be doing well, because if you look at death rates per 100,000 in Europe, and this red dot, this is Scotland. Um, it's the sick man of Europe, just sitting just below Albania here. But if we go to the right-hand side, this really shows that most of Scotland actually does pretty well. Our age and health is not bad, but the picture is skewed by the east end of Glasgow. Uh, and here, this is Calton, where life expectancy uh, at birth, the predicted life expectancy at birth for a man is 54 years. So that's worse than sub-Saharan Africa. And it's a disgrace that it's happening in the UK. This, is, this of course, is linked to deprivation and the earlier onset of diseases of aging. And by deprivation, I just do not mean poverty. It's a lack of resources, it's a lack of choices. It's a toxic social and environmental milieu that drives this. And to get a handle on how that is happening, we have really focused on the concept of the exposome. And this was something that was really uh, derived by Conrad Wild when studying cancer and looking at environmental influences on predisposition and development to cancer. And we've exploited that now to look at ageing. And it really encompasses what you've been exposed to, so either abiotic or biotic exposures, from your childhood into adulthood, so across your life course. Um, as a, a lab-based scientist, it's often difficult to grapple with a lot of this. It feels a little touchy-feely. But it is important how your parents have uh, raised you. Do they nurture you or are they threatening and abusive? Are your family, again, nurturing or abusive? Is the environment you live in threatening or supportive? And you can work through the various layers of this, macro being the, really the, the social and, uh, environment you live in at, at a greater scale. So you know, is it well resourced? Spirituality seems to be a big part of this in how you age. The exosystem where you're looking at the size and type of housing you live in and the density you live at. And this all creates a sort of a, a drip, drip, drip effect of pressures on your biology across your life course. And it can lead to adverse outcomes. To emphasise how important it is, 
three simple exposome factors are responsible for 50% of global deaths annually. That's air pollution, tobacco smoke and diet. And we in Glasgow, along with colleagues at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, have over the years been trying to model the interactions of our environment with our biology, particularly our genome and epigenome. And to do so, we've taken the kidney as a model for this, because with chronic kidney disease, which is now a, a epidemic, there's more than 150 million people presenting with chronic kidney disease globally. It's also now with climate change starting to affect our domestic livestock. And it results in accelerated aging. But in this context, one of the treatments is transplantation, renal transplantation. And that's a piece of healthy tissue whose function we can track longitudinally so we get a better picture of how normative features of aging are influenced by our environment. So we have looked at our geophysical environment, our social environment, and we've focused a lot on food and its interaction with the microbiome and how this influences our genome and epigenome either related to health or disease. And in Glasgow, we've identified a number of specific exposome factors that influence aging and health in the general population. It's not a clinical population, the general population. In particular, we have looked at how diet and inflammation are related to features of cellular aging, such as telomeratrition, tied to household income and deprivation status. You can actually stratify levels of deprivation across the city one being affluence, seven being utter deprivation. Indeed, those in the lowest three categories, so five, six, and seven, uh, have less methylation on their DNA. Their epigenome reflects their deprivation status. And that, in turn, is also influenced with the appearance of a, a dysbiotic microbiome. And in this instance, the, the title here is circulatory microbiota is a bit misleading. We're looking not at live organisms, but DNA fragments from bacteria that have managed to get from the gut or the gums or the mouth into the circulation. And those that are deprived tend to have more oral pathobionts in their system associated with poorer health, in particular poorer renal health. And we also see this as a consequence of diet and eating too much red meat and being hyperphosphatemic in a general population where those in deprivation present with renal function that's equivalent to mild to moderate kidney disease. So understanding chronic kidney disease and how it develops is important. Uh, in particular, this link with inflammation, which is also a feature of aging. And typically, if you have chronic kidney disease, then you see muscle wasting, osteoporosis, vascular calcification, and uh, cardiovascular hypertrophy, along with a range of subcellular features that people like myself are more familiar with. And we'll come on to those in a little moment. But interestingly, if you look at chronic kidney disease, you can see here, in a comparison with a range of other non communicable diseases, that delta between your chronological age and biological age, i.e. miles in the clock, shows that if you're diagnosed early with chronic kidney disease, you tend to have five more years on your clock than expected. The disease will then progress to, from a stage one to stage five, and at five you've got end-stage renal disease where your kidney functions very, very poor, and you either need to go on hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis, or have a transplant. Survival rates on dialysis are not good. It's 50% approximately at three years. If you get a transplant, yeah, the outcome's much better. But currently about one in seven people waiting for a transplant actually get one. So again, it's not a nice situation to be in. If you have the kidney disease, as I've mentioned, you see a range of features that are typically associated with aging across taxa, so in flies and yeast and worms and mice and in humans. And and you have telomere attrition, increased cellular senescence, the gut dysbiosis, and it's not a happy picture. And indeed, as we've observed in the general population, you get epigenetic dysregulation, so you see changes in your epigenome. 
Fortunately, the picture is improving and now there are a range of senotherapeutic drugs that may have efficacy here. These need not necessarily all be synthetic agents or novel chemical entities. You can use naturally occurring bioactive substances. And you see, along with the senolytics, we can get things such as fisetin or quercetin, which are currently being trialled. And I'll blow my own trumpet for a moment because we have also moved into this space by trying to use polyphenolics to manipulate the microbiome and generate a more salutogenic or health-promoting microbiome to enhance the physical and physiological capabilities of those on dialysis. And we've achieved this successfully in our first randomized controlled double-blind clinical trial. And this is using propolis, uh, an agent from beeswax. It's a mix of polyphenolics, so it does work. However, we, we still have a number of problems with any such interventions to improve age-related health within that central therapeutic space. And one of the, the main problems is actually how good are the markers we have to measure aging. We need you know, sensitive and specific markers that can precisely measure not just how many miles we've got on the clock, but at what rate we're moving at, and does that change across our life course such that we will know when and where to intervene most appropriately, i.e. can we intervene in early years, do we have to wait in middle age, or do we have to wait till we have an overt disease, potentially when the, you know, the horse is bolted and we're still trying to lock the stable door. Um, so odometers and speedometers are important. And from a, a range of tools we have to measure aging, either very basic tools, such as gait speed or chair rise, which work very well at predicting the likelihood of mortality in the old. Um, we're also looking at lens density in the eye, which we you know, have published on previously, and we know works better than telomere length or measuring P16, um, which was a surprise at the time. But more recently, biochemical measures that can be used at large scale and used quickly um, have developed which are much more appealing. Traditionally, we've used telomere length, but telomere length in the renal model shows that it, it, this is a very weak marker of aging. It explains less than 10% of inter-individual variation that function in the kidney. Um, CDKN2 lobus that you know, encodes for P16, also good, but in the, the context of the kidney model, can only explain around 25% of the inter-individual variation uh, in function. And then we have skin odor fluorescence, phenotypic age, and more recently, <coughs> microbiome composition and characterization of metabolites that might be able to work as a clock. Skin odor fluorescence measuring age glycation end products, a phenotypic age which measures a range of different blood parameters <coughs> or blood based parameters have been used widely. But in our kidney model, um, we have wanted to compare them head to head, and we've wanted to compare them also alongside a range of other potential clocks. And what we've been asking more recently is, do any of the common treatments for chronic kidney disease, dialysis or transplantation, actually you know, ameliorate the aging we see associated with the disease? And then we want to compare the clocks head to head to see which are the most effective and whether or not they're good at reporting changes in normative aging and not overt disease. <clears throat> so we, if you look at chronic kidney disease, we see that skin odor fluorescence and phenotypic age work relatively well, but they give you biologically implausible estimates of age when you're ill. Um, and, you know, for example, with SAF, Age 200, biologically implausible. <coughs> and again here, in the early stages of the disease, you get a reasonable match with chronological age, but by the time you've got CKD 4 to 5, the age estimates are biologically implausible. <coughs> so a step forward has been the development of methylation-based clocks. Steve Horvath came up with the first disease 10 years ago now. Um, and we were a little bit sceptical about what they could do, but you know, time has shown that these are smart tools. 
Um, often expensive to use if you're a laboratory based scientist, but the price is dropping. Technically complex, but they do report well. And <clears throat> there are a number of them now. A first generation simply trained on chronological age, and a second generation of clocks that have been trained on age plus um, biochemical and lifestyle factors. In particular, one of the more recent ones is PhenoAge. Um, I'll just see yeah, I've misspelled Grim Age, it's to be Grim Age. Uh, I'll tell you about a comparison now between the Horvath clock, Hannon clock, and the Pheno Age clock. We have also looked at Grim Age, but we haven't uh, shown that data to Steve Horvath, who very kindly and um, <coughs> unprompted sent us his algorithm to use when, when aware of what we were doing. So we were delighted with that. And what we've done in, in a small study is look at a range of individuals and track their journey through CKD to when they get a transplant and then follow them up a year later. Getting access to these patients is not easy. And looking at them in terms of their biology, especially if you've got to get a, a biopsy from a kidney one year after a transplant, it's not, it's not trivial. And we do this in collaboration with the Karolinska Institute. To standard measurements of DNA methylation for the clocks, of each clock we calculate the methylation age as well as the age acceleration associated with the disease and then in response to therapy. And what we see that most of the clocks estimate chronological age accurately. Um, and generally, the, you know, the median absolute error is around four, four years. Um, we have a composite clock here I'll tell you about in a moment. That's uh, a combination of Horvath, Hanum, and Fino age. And you can see here, because you're dealing with a biological system, there's a lot of noise. And if you, you know, make a composite, it helps reduce that. So I suppose the number of all this is, <coughs> how do these things match up, for example, with chronological age? And you can see they match up really well. But how do they match up when you view them in terms of age-related physiological function and healthy tissue? So that's going to the transplant and comparing what happens when you are diseased and then have the transplant or are on dialysis. And what we see is that the clocks report well, but two of them, Horvath and Hannah, don't really show any difference in terms of your biological age when you have had a transplant and you know that your physiology has improved in comparison to those on hemodialysis, there's no difference. Pheno age, which incorporates a number of different biochemical measures and a composite clock that we have developed, it's now called the Glasgow Karolinska clock, I believe, um, shows that hemodialysis doesn't change the rate at which you're aging. So you're sick and you're with dialysis, you're really treading water and the rate of aging is still steady. And it's accelerated with respect to healthy controls. The transplant, however, does improve the situation when measured by these clocks. So it's not reversing aging. I think that's key to say. All you're doing is slowing down the rate at which you age and normalizing it. And we're you know, very happy with that because this is a test of the, you know, these clocks, essentially in a clinical environment. So even though this is a relatively small study, we have hope as we expand this, that this situation will even improve as power increases. So in conclusion with this, I would say that, yeah, CKD patients do, as you might expect, display an increased epigenetic age, and that is in keeping with what we see with other biomarkers of aging. That that age acceleration is partially mitigated after transplantation, but not in patients under dialysis. And a composite clock works well and reports accurately in a clinical setting. And it matches this standard clinical appraisal of renal function because that five years that I show you at the start is pretty similar to what we're seeing um, in that, po that renal population. So there is still that age gap, but the rate at which you're accumulating miles in the clock then sort of levels off. Uh, so where are we going with this? Well, I think we're now moving into a, long, a longitudinal study of ageing in the general population. Um, 
moving out to look at 5,000 individuals in the longitudinal analysis going from start of the life course to looking at maternal blood, cord blood, fetal blood, right through across the age spectrum. Uh, and we have some individuals that are centenarians, most of course are in that gap between age 18 and age 80. Um, we're wanting to know, can we prognosticate on morbidity with this? Can we predict the likelihood of mortality? There's lots of interest in this. But more importantly, I think we want to go back up what we're saying in terms of how useful these clocks are at tracking the efficacy of any therapeutic interventions, but also to be able to see when and where people are deviating from their normal you know, age-related trajectories, identify them early, and intervene you know, appropriately or direct them to intervention um, when we can. And to that end, we're going to try and start tuning these clocks. There's a, a range of other new clocks out there as well, but we have one that we think we can tune against biophysical and biochemical parameters in the general population rather than in a, a clinical population with overt disease. And so now then we're playing with phosphate and the relationship between serum phosphate and longevity in mammals is very, very strong. The correlation is about 0.9. Um, and you can see here, there's, you, you can use this to discriminate between centenarians, you know, mere mortals like ourselves, and those with uh, progeriatus as such as in Skilfer's progeriate syndrome. We're going to incorporate this into the clock to see if we can have a, a more effective and better read of biological versus chronological age. So I will finish by introducing you, if you're not already aware of him, to another uh, Irishman called Flan O'Brien. And I think his quote sums up my talk. It's surely the work of wisdom because not one word of it do I understand. Um, I'd like to thank the groups I work with, but in particular my own lab, Anogni and Nietzsche, uh, a former economist turned scientist, who has been outstanding in developing biomarkers of aging, <coughs> tracking how they work in a general population, and they created our clock analysis for us. Um, my collaborators at the Karolinska Institute, in particular, Peter Steinwinkel and Helen Erlandson, who provided us with our renal material. And also worth mentioning here is Paul Otolan Cork, who's a guru for microbiome work. Uh, and Denise Mafra and Fluminense, who has enabled us to do uh, clinical interventions. Uh, I'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Now, um, we have a little bit of time for questions. We are still running on time after the first talk. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so, happy to take questions. Hi, Andrew. Hi. Um, I just wondered, um, I was chatting with someone the other day about the potential of organ transplantation as an age reversal strategy. And we were talking about whether the age of the donor organ mattered. And obviously, there's all this work about parabiosis, where it's, you know, to some extent, it might be that the old mouse is borrowing the young mouse's kidneys or liver. So, did you look at the age of the donor or the epigenetic age of the donor kidney? Um, yes, always. And the, you know, we have a, a range of features based around aging in those kidneys. So, we have both measurements of CDK and 2A, which we know can predict about 25% so of the function of the organ and a range of non-coding RNAs associated with that locus. It can explain a lot more. Um, and we do stratify within our analysis for that. So yeah, the, the age of the donor organ is always important. And in the context of parabiosis, I think that's you know, from what I know of it. I've always been skeptical of parabiosis. Uh, I think I'm scarred by reading some of the historical accounts of this and people have been doing Glandular transfer, um, you know, it's like testicular transplants in the 1930s. And the attrition rate in generating parabiotic animals is staggering. Uh, I think it would be something that would be difficult to do in the UK. But I think the basis of it is not necessarily the, the, one of the older animals borrowing the kidneys or liver, which I think is a really good point. You know, there will be some of that, but it's more than likely driven by extracellular vesicles that are facilitating repair, and some of these vesicles are lost over time, and therefore, you know, that you can replicate parabiosis using microvesicle transfer, and we've done that in the kidney. You can restore, 
You can destroy 95% of a kidney's function through two hours of ischemia, which is something you wouldn't typically do in a model, but you can do it. And then you can restore its function within two weeks and its uh, histology back to normal within six weeks just using that. So I think that's probably the route, but you know, it's still speculation on my part. But I do, uh, you know, I think you have hit the nail on the head in that you are borrowing function to some degree if you're going to join up circulations, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Probably just time for one more question. I'm sorry, Richard, maybe you'll have to grab in the... Uh, just, I, just following on from that point, um, I was going to ask you about the tissue specificity of the clocks that you're seeing, and, it's, and then from that, the sort of flow of the signal. So, you know, is the kidney signaling to the body? We're well aware of people that have a single organ failure that have this systemic deterioration. I, I agree, I'm a microvascular. Yeah, it's actually it's a difficult one to answer without having solid data, the underpinning. But yeah, yeah I, I believe I believe the kidneys, you know, renal certainly cardio renal function is key here. If you think back to the old Barker hypothesis, mm -hmm. and you know, renal function, birth weight, and size of the kidney at birth is important. Um, and our sort of comparator with all this and the effect of the exposome also takes in this difference in renal size. Um, when we compare you know, similar studies with those that are from the West versus Japan, where Japanese have got smaller kidneys, um, but they tend to do better in hemodialysis and transplantation because better lifestyle, better environment, better diet, and a different microbiome. Um, but yeah, for me, there is a knock-on effect, it's a systemic effect, and that's what we're picking up. The clocks that we use have all been developed for example, from blood, um, and that helps. There are other clocks that are meant to be tissue specific. I remain skeptical about how well they are reporting on the function of a given organ. For example, a clock for brain age. You know, the jury's out on that for me until I we'll see some data. Actually, I think, Richard, if you're very, very quick, you can take your question. Hi, yourself. thank you uh, for a great talk as always. Have you correlated your biomarkers of your, of your epigenetic clots with our favourite inflammation biomarkers? So, en route, um, I think for us, the, the big, when we were doing the analysis of the general population, there's this you know, correlation between the number of old cells or senescent cells and their pro-inflammatory secretome meaning that the most aged should be the most inflamed and the correlation should be strong. Um, we saw in the general population that biological age, either using P16 or telomere length, explains less than 10% of the inflammatory burden. And you can use two microbial metabolites to explain more than 50%. So that was a bit of a shock. Um, so we will, as this moves forward, start incorporating more appropriate pro, uh, inflammatory markers in to see if we get a better fit. Um, but clearly, you know, inflammation's a big, big player in how we age. And you know, it's not always properly addressed in, in these analyses. Hi, I'm so sorry, but in the interest of time, we do need to move on to the next one. So would you mind having Richard in? Uh, no, sorry. Uh -huh. <laughs> There's too many Richards in this room. <laughs> Grabbing Paul in the coffee break, sorry. I just wanted to comment on the question. There is an information biomarker which might be It's called glycos. Sorry. Um, it's on immunoglobulin G, the information biomarker, which you may not have heard of or taken into account, but uh, we can speak later about it. They're called glycos. Yeah. Okay. And Thank there's a biological agent clock also developed. The, the glycan age clock, which we haven't tested yet, but which we would very much like to do. <laughs> Thank you for that.